excellent. Okay, there we go. Ulo, welcome to the show. It's it's really great to have you on, and and I'm and I'm excited to to actually have this conversation. Actually, I, I'm I'm I don't know if I'm excited to have this. I, it was the one thing in statistics that I didn't really enjoy very much. I must admit, um, but you know, statistics is is so important in a lot of the things that we do. And when we talk about AI and machine learning and the math that goes into it, there is a lot of mathematics and statistics that plays a, a really important role in, in, in how we talk about things and, and um, especially in our world of pharmaceuticals. But you know, the, the, the whole structure of this talk is like, what is the value of p-value, you know, after a hundred years of it being proposed or or brought forward and you know does it still have the same level of value but before we jump into that i, I you know for those people that are listening uh you know how would you define p-value if you were explaining it to your niece or nephew or or grandchildren thank you harry that's a very very good and important question especially as p-value determines everything what we do in drug development or in medical research and medical research and drug development impacts all impacts our, our health so let's go back to, to, to the basics so the p stands for probability so p is nothing else than a value that measures or determines or forecasts projects the probability of an, um, of an observation. So, and let me explain what I mean by obser observation. So, usually, <clears throat> usually in drug development, you have, you want to know whether a drug is working. So, you compare it in a so-called treatment group against a, a, a placebo group. Okay, and out of your research, comes an observation and the observation is that the drug has a certain has a certain effect okay so now the question is what is the probability of this effect to be different from say the chance so this is how i would put the p value into into an into a nutshell so, but so let's now dive a little bit deeper into, uh, into the uh, definitions. And I think later in the, in the show, it becomes very clear why we need to go uh, into the me mechanics of, of the p-value because the p-value is widely used in every place in our modern life, especially in medicine, as I said before, but unfortunately, it's also widely misused. Yes. And that's a big issue. Yeah. So let's say what the p-value is. The p-value is a probability of, an, of a result or an observation under the assumption that the so-called null hypothesis is true. And that's very important to remember. It is a probability under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. And let me explain what the null hypothesis is. Sounds fancy, but it isn't <laughs> very, very fancy at all. It's just the terminology that is used. The null hypothesis is nothing else than um, stating that there is no difference in pharmaceuticals now between the treatment group and placebo group. So we assume that it's the both groups are in fact identical overlapping. So if that is our underlying hypothesis, that there is no different, then the p-value is a probability that a certain result is still true despite the fact that we are assuming that there is no difference. So let me give you, um, give you an example. Let's say um, we have an effect on our blood pressure, that the blood pressure goes down 10, um, 10 millimeter mercury. 
So that's what uh, is our obs observation. Mm -hmm. So if you say the null hypothesis is, well, there's no difference. The drug doesn't anything. So what is the probability that our observation that it goes down 10% is real? So if the p-value is then 5% or less than 5%, it means that the uh, probability of this to be a chance effect is less is 5% or less. Harry, do you think that it's clear or do you need to go a little bit no, more? No, no, no. Well, I was going to ask you sort, sort of like there's this, you know, P is, you know, 0 0.05. And, and that's been, you know, a, a threshold I've heard for a long time, right? And it, it's, you know, it's supposed to be me, it's supposed to mean statistically significant. And it's a term that gets thrown around by lots of people. But, you know, what does it exactly mean if you were explaining it to the listeners? <laughs> um. Harry, can I first go a little bit into the history uh, sure. of the p-value? I think it is important to understand the history in order to put the p-value into the right, um, the right context. So the p-value was first uh, developed by a statistician, Carl Persson, uh, around the beginning of, uh, beginning of last century. Beginning of last century. Then it was popularized by Sir Ronald Fisher, a statistician who was born 1890. So. It was just like yesterday. He was, yes, so <laughs> like yesterday. And we are, still, we are still using it. Yes. Well, of course, we are still using combustion engines who were developed at around the same time. So it may not be surprising. <laughs> but as we know that combustion engines are now on the way out, let's see. Um, let's see what's going to happen to the p-value. But I'm jumping ahead. Let's go back to um, Sir Ronald, uh, Ronald Fisher. So Sir um, uh, Ronald Fisher took the concept of the p-value and then he wrote in 1925 um, uh, a very important statistical book for researchers. And in that book he, he said, well, uh, in his opinion, so we should have thresholds uh, for the p-value. He, he used the p-value as a strength of evidence. Yep. And he said 5% is, his feeling is 5% is, is a good cut cutoff value. And an even stronger, um, uh, stronger p-value is, let's say, 1%, percent point one or point yep. one percent So... What people don't often realize that this p-value of five percent, uh, the significance um, level, was pulled out of thin air, and I would even say, if Sir Ronald Fisher would have had, as you know, medically it sometimes happens, if he would have had six fingers on his one hand then we would be today all using 6% <laughs> as a cutoff. And, and everybody needs to understand how fundamental this number is in science, um, in drug development. Um, this, this number is sort of almost, there's no way to get around it in, in a sense if you're thinking about it when you're talking about developing a product. That's absolutely right, and that's that's a big issue. So that because people use a p-value as if it would be something divine, so <laughs> as a natural constant, and we have a natural constant. You know the number pi. Yes. There's no question about it. It's a natural constant. It, independent of you, me, whether the world ends, the number pi exists. But you cannot say the same for the p-value of 5%. It yeah. is not a natural constant. And the issue it creates is that this 5% is used to now categorize research into two categories. 
research that is working, supposedly working, and research that is supposedly not working. Right. So that puts us into this, um, I would say, funny situation that we set up all our research with a lot of precision. Um, we don't use categorical values. We use continuous values. We do all the measurements. Yeah. And then at the end, we simply use this arbitrary 5% <laughs> from Sir Ronald Fisher from 1925. And we may make a statement, oh, this drug is working or is, um, is not working. But, 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 you know, I mean, we're talking about, I mean, we have all the modern data science approaches. We have multiple data sources coming in now feeding uh, you know, different aspects of a patient, how they react, um, all these concepts of precision medicine. So what is the current debate in the scientific community around p-value? I and mean, why, do, why do some scientists, you know, stick with it? And why are others moving on? It's a very good question, Ali. Let's put precision medicine aside for a moment because that's a topic for its own, because there's not just the issue of the p-value, there's also the so-called mean of a group, the average that is used in traditional yep. statistics, uh, which doesn't go well to work well together with uh, precision <laughs> medicine or with individualized personalized medicine, but let's put that in, uh, aside. So, how the p-value mm, you, mm, used and, 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 and misused? So I watched CNN this morning and they talked about um, a new England medical journal study on hydroxychloroquine. You know, this is a drug yes. that is being yes. used. Miracle drug. It in, uh, supposedly a miracle <laughs> drug. But in all fairness, so what in the op observational study, it didn't show statistical significance. I'm not necessarily surprised about it. However, the way it was interpreted was, oh, it doesn't work. Right. And that is, that is how the p-value is absolutely misunderstood and is doing harm. Because if a result is not significant, it doesn't mean in any way that the compound is not working. It only, uh, the p-value that's greater than five only says that the probability that it may, um, that it may work is higher. It's higher than the, than the five, uh, than, than the five percent. You follow me? Yep. So, if a drug, the outcome of an, uh, on, of uh, research is not significant, you should never ever say it is not working. You can only say we were not able to show or make a determination whether it works or not. That's it. And okay, the question is, so do you leave it by that or you somehow st still try to get some evidence out of that trial. Yes, of course you should, but not by fixating on the p-value, but by looking at the data. Looking at data even from individual patients, looking at the spread of data, looking at confidence, uh, confidence in, 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 in intervals, and that gives you an understanding of how this compound may have worked or, or, or not work. So why is the p-value so beloved in the scientific community? Because we as humans, we love simple concepts. It's yeah. easy. Right. It's black or white. It's working or it's not working. <laughs> so, and that is what journal editors do all the time. They get so many um, submissions of articles. And this is where the bias kicks in articles so this is easy to sort oh 
they had a negative, they had a p-value greater than 5%, okay, we drop it. Oh, p-value less than 5%, we publish it in a, simplified, in, in a simplified way, because it's so simple. And researchers, PhDs, medics, are usually not statisticians. So they all the, the, the whole mathematical basis is sort of a mystery. So it's very easy when you, when you say, okay, I don't understand that really, but I know that if it's significant, it works. If it isn't significant, it doesn't work. So right. that's why I decided. And by the way, in all fairness to the statisticians, the statisticians, a lot of statisticians are up in arms. They say, no, you cannot do it. That's not the way how you could use a p-value. And there was a publication in Nature that where the authors say, when they put the, column, they put the article out and ask for support, there were hundreds and hundreds of prominent statisticians who signed off on saying we have to abandon the term of significance. We can use a p-value as it was originally designed as a probability measure, but we should not say that something is significant and something is not significant only because there was one gentleman more than 100, about 100 <laughs> years ago who simply said, well, it makes sense. Yes, no, I understand. I mean, especially now when you think about all the tools that we have at our disposable, all, all the things that we're able to measure that go into our experiments. Um, so what are the alternatives? I mean, you and I have talked about this offline, you know, uh, but what are some of the alternatives that you can think of? And, and, and if you use the alternatives and, and write a paper and, and submit it to a journal, how can you get them to even publish it or, or pay attention to it? Okay, yes, it's a very good question. There are, um, uh, there are of course, um, um, alternatives, but let me start um, uh, first with the most important thing. We have to accept that there's no such thing like the fountain of truth in science as there's no such thing like a fountain of youth. Right, so, although we keep looking for it. Yeah, we keep looking for it. <laughs> uh, it, won't be, um, it won't be a fountain of truth. That means we have to simply accept that uh, there will be never a method that is simply telling us, that's it, black or white. Science is not black or white. So we have to do the hard work and take a look at the data and not just trust the p-value. We have to go one level deeper. We have to look at how does the data look. So we have an alternative is to use confidence intervals and understand what the confidence intervals mean. So let me give you, give you, an, give you an example. So let's say uh, we want, want to know whether a certain drug causes arrhythmia heart arrhythmia. Mm -hmm. So we have two studies. One study clearly shows, yes, it creates arrhythmia. And the point estimates as in, let's say, 30% of the cases. And it's significant. The other study is not significant. And the average value was still 30%. So how can that be? Should we dismiss that other study and say, the, you know, the other study even showed that it can be proven it doesn't cause arrhythmia. That's exactly the wrong, the, wrong, the wrong approach. So you take a look at compare both confidence intervals. One is overlapping, maybe overlapping the zero. You see the spread of the outcome, but you still see on, on the left side are patients who didn't have a risk. Right. But you see on the right side, that there are plenty of patients who had arrhythmia. So you cannot say it, didn't, it doesn't cause, it cause arrhythmia. Right. So when you look at the data, you understand how a certain p-value came about and you can put it into, in, into context, you can look at subgroups and you can describe your whole patient problem or, or the, the patient population you use in your, in your study in a much more differentiated way and can use as science is, um, as clinical studies are 
usually they are they are just a stepping stone they lead you to create an hypothesis which you then work on in your next study and your next study and your next study that's how um, medical knowledge is um, is uh, is created but don't focus on the people you say the study was not significant you need to do the hard work to go into uh, go into the details so this is i think a very clear alternative if you still stick um, only to the traditional statistics so I think currently, because the statisticians are talking so loudly about it and say this is an issue, you cannot, we didn't invent the tool for you to misuse it this way. <laughs> Journal editors, I think, are beginning to, to wake up. And if you do enough explanation, you show that you really dig into the data and you demonstrate what the knowledge gain from your work is, I think you still have a good chance to get published. But it is, I admit, probably a little bit of an uphill battle. That's why it is, of course, easier if you get a P value less than 5% right from the get go, because it's like giving you a VIP pass. Yeah, of course. Say, I'm a VIP, which is, of course, nonsense. But as we're, but as we're a lot of these products were looking at it's not always cut and dry um i mean i know we're going to engage in some of this conversation next week um but you know if life was so cut and dry like you know everything would be so much easier uh but it's not and it's getting more complicated especially in some of these diseases where everything is not obvious at the get-go and you have to, you know, wind your way to a, a, a reasonable endpoint. So where do you see where do you see the best tools to incorporate into this? And how are you looking at the world? Because I know you would love to see it change a little bit faster than I think it has been. I absolutely agree with you. Things are moving on too slow. So it's really painful for me to observe that in the year 2020, in the world of artificial intelligence, big data, you name it, we are still clinging to the concepts that were developed and partially pulled out of thin air <laughs> hundred years ago. So this is very painful, painful to watch. But I'm optimistic that uh, things are going to they're going to change so but let me talk about uh, now of another problem we have is traditional statistics it's not just a p-value it's a way we create evidence by averaging by uh, calculating the mean so mm -hmm. look the way we usually run our our studies and how study and drugs get also approved is we enroll let's say 1,000 patients in each group, placebo 1,000 patients, treatment group 1,000 patients, and let's say the blood pressure medication again. So, and then the average value is 10 millimeter mercury reduction in blood pressure mm -hmm. on an average. So, but what, it, we, what we are basically doing here is saying, okay, on an average 10 millimeter mercury reduction, and then we are applying it to an individual yeah. patient. So we, it's very important to understand. We yeah. measure 1,000 people, takes the average, and then we go to come to you, Harry, and say, look, this drug reduces um, yeah. blood pressure by 10 millimeter mercury. The concept simply doesn't make sense. Yeah. So, and as we are moving, closer and uh, more and more in the direction of precision medicine yeah. of personalized medicine the less we can take the average of a group of people and apply to, um, to an individual and let me say a few words about the biology why, why it doesn't make sense bio biological nearly because that's true for every disease and especially true for, for, for cancer, 
our physiological values, parameters, or whatever you call it, let's say blood pressure, are the result of the interplay of millions of underlying biological feedback loops. Right. And your feedback loops, the composition of all your feedback loops is different for you than it is for me. Yep. And the drugs work on those feedback, the feedback loops. So this drug that has certain, creates a certain average value may lower your blood pressure by 20 or by 30 and may not do for me anything, anything right. because it's, I have a different composition of my underlying feedback loops. Right. And the outcome is, and I would like to quote here um, David Sinclair, the Harvard professor. He is saying our medicine is a medicine that works most of the time for most people. So, so that which means, how well, do you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, I would go, actually, you know, it's sort of, I know that that's how we see it, but in reality, it is a trial and error process, right? I give you the drug. If it works, great, you're fine. If it doesn't come back, I might switch it to another one, see if that one works, right? And it, it's, 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 not, it's not the exact science that I think people or the public actually believes that it may be. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's exactly that's exactly the exactly the issue here. So, we have exact science, and use it to get our regulatory approval. Okay. Well, that's a that's a key. That was a key phrase. Get our regulatory approval. So I I I I'm I'm in lockstep with you on that. But after that regulatory approval, trial and error starts. That is yes. how the individual physician now begins to use and um, use that, that treatment. And I think, in my view, I'm a physician by training, and I think that the current um, regulatory process, the focus on the simple statistics uh, does not recognize the value of the physician-patient relationship. It is a physician that knows his patient, knows how to apply it. Um, let, me, let me give you an example, my, an interaction I had many, many years ago with, uh, with regulators about that. So, we were developing, uh, developing a CO, COPD drug for COPD. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that the average, the average improvement in lung function was 50 ml. So, but when you look at the distribution, there were patients who didn't improve at all, patients uh, where the COPD continued to worsen. Right. But there were patients there, and a lot of patients, who improved 100 ml, 200 ml, some even 300 ml. Really a medically meaningful effect. Right. So, but the discussion focused with the agency on, oh, is 50 ml meaningful? And I tried to <laughs> talk about it until I was blue in my head that this 50 ml is just an average of a population. You cannot say, okay, is 50 ml now meaningful because this average patient doesn't exist. It's a fake patient. Yes. But still, we weren't able to get the data which showed the distribution into the label. That was my um, intent because I wanted the physicians to see that there are patients who improve by 200, 300 ml so that they can uh, use it and then say, well, this patient really improved. I keep him on the drug. I don't. The other patient didn't um, respond. I'm not putting him on or discontinue the drug. But simply the focus on this average, which was, by the way, it was even significant. <laughs> uh, 50 ml, that was the discussion focused on. It's not clinically meaningful, so we don't put it into the label. So 
how are people now, how do you see the system or drug development changing in a sense of what other, you know, how is data science really affecting how we look at this data and how we're going to be presenting it in the future? Because it cannot stay the same as both of us know. I think we have to use the tools of uh, tools of my machine machine learning, uh, modern big data. These are this is what we need for uh, for evidence gen generation, because look, our single focus on individual variables and ignoring every everything else is only because of the restrictions of our human brains. We cannot see too many right. factors uh, um, uh, at the same time and, and understand how they interact. And somewhere I read that the best brains can make a um, juggle up to seven different um, items and the relationships, yep. graph it, but then it's an end. Yeah. So let me say seven different items a modern computer laughs you out of the room. Right, right, right. I've, I've actually, I've read five, which is even, you know, um, seven would be very impressive. Um, but yes, I mean, and then most, I think average humans, I don't know how many they can see, but I don't even think it's five. That's exactly the point. So, so now I, I imagine your body being, uh, yeah, being a glass box where you, where you can see you put something in. So you put, put a, dr a drug in, it does something. So it doesn't only influence one, para one parameter, which you then, uh, where you run a biostatistical test, a p-value, and then you get the truth out and says it's working, it's not working. No, that's not the reality. It influences all this in the biological, or the, most of the biological feedback loops we just uh, net talk about it yep. so it's like a mesh it moves it the pattern is changing yeah so but that's a clue now where uh, does ai have its strength it can recognize pattern mm -hmm. and in a way humans never can it can discern what uh, that a is different from uh, dif different from from b so it looks at the multitude of the data at the same time, which is unfortunately more than just five or seven. Yep. And there are so, some companies that are trying to capture all that data and, and, and have the system learn the pattern of how this change happens and what happens and, and measure it and then create I don't, I don't want to say pictures, but you can, you can see that when a drug is affecting the pattern you want, the way that you want it to affect. Um, Absolutely. Let me give you, let you give me, give you just an example where it's beginning to work. And I'm very optimistic that we will have a great, great future in medicine and medical research where we get insights that were unthinkable in the past. So let's take, for example, the area of depression, CNS mm -hmm. research. So by the way, this is also something if you really think, if think through it, what we are doing is also stuck in the last, last, in the last century. And I've spoken to uh, some psychiatrists who tell me, no, it's not last century. It hasn't changed since President Lincoln, which goes even further. <laughs> So okay. I talk to you, Harry, and I have a rating scale. And then I give you a score based on what you tell me and based how you answer my questions. The score could be 30, could be 15, and, and so on. Right. So what we do now, then we have the score threshold and say, OK, you're depressed or you're not depressed. And then we pool all that data from thousands of patients. And then we run an exact statistical test on it on this subjective rating, mm -hmm. and then we say, okay, a certain drug is helping depression or is not helping depression. So that's the way we do it. So, but fortunately, we have different tools. We have today the ability using functional MRI that shows 
the activity in certain areas of the uh, certain areas of of the brain. Yep. And then we can use uh, artificial in intelligence to analyze these pattern. So what we are learning there is that we there's not only one type of depression. Yes. There may be five, six, seven type of depressions because they affect different areas of your brain. You have different pattern. Right. So instead of developing uh, developing a, a drug and relying on the subjective questionnaire, what we can do today, and this is, I think will be the future, we develop drugs and observe how the pattern is changing in your brain. Because that is a direct measurement of the activities of your neural circuitry. And we yeah. do, go ahead. Yes, and I'm just trying to think of like then taking that data and then submitting it to the agency needs to change and adapt how they view this. Your investors need to think about this differently, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going through the process of, right, as we keep digging deeper and multiple data streams open up. Right, we understand that breast cancer is not just one breast cancer; it's multiple breasts, it's multiple forms. Yes, that at some point, understanding data science is understanding that next level of data is critical to be able to make a reasonable decision going forward. Let me say, uh, in my interactions with with regulators, I have seen, I met great people open-minded people and they want to move on and in all fairness to the regulators they say prove it prove it that your methodology your diagnostics you change it that it is really uh, changing health in a positive direction so i think that's up to us uh, researchers to use these tools and demonstrate, validate them to show that they make a difference. Because otherwise we run the risk that, uh, let me say there will be so many people coming and uh, coming out of the woods who say, okay, I found something, I found a pattern, right, right, found a pattern right. there. Uh, the agencies they are responsible for the national health and they have to make sure that things really work. So I wouldn't put it in, um, blame the agencies. I think the agency has, uh, especially big, uh, now with the 21st Central Cure Act, Yes, they are keenly aware that things are changing. And if I think about um, agency leaders like Janet Woodcock, uh, they are even head of the industry. They, they are pushing for using these new tools. Yep. But the only thing what they're saying, hey, you, use, you need to use it in a way that it is understood and you need to prove it. Yeah, uh, as long as the guidelines are, I think there needs to be some guidelines in place so that somebody stepping up can show that it works. Um, uh, absolutely. But it's, we're in, I, and I keep saying this, I think I've been saying the same thing for the last 15 years is we're in the most fascinating time of science. The, the pieces that are coming together at the same time are causing a dramatic uplift in the whole space. And the pandemic is, I think, going to accentuate uh, where science really needs to lead forward. Uh, you're absolutely, absolutely right. And maybe if I may put it in one sing, uh, simple sentence, where I, we are, uh, where I see what's happening, we are at the cusp of a change. We are, we are and we have to move uh, move from this population medicine to personalized medicine because we are much more different in the inside than uh, the traditional methods are able to um, uh, are able to grasp yes use, use that word so we are moving away from the focus on a single variable to a focus on pattern 
we are looking for changes in pattern. And then if you think about the world of genomics, proteonomics, and A interference, yep. it is all about changing changes in pattern. You cannot, you do not taking any more one single um, pixel there and calculating the confidence interval and running a t, uh, um, running a t test on it. No, no, you're measuring the pattern and put it in context. And, um, you know, many years ago, I read the book by David Agus, The End of Illness. And uh, he was, um, I think he was um, also a physician for um, oncologist for Steve Jobs. And he focused in his book very much on proteonom proteonomics. What he is saying that before the illness arrives, quote unquote, you have many years, maybe 20 years before, you have a change in the pattern of your proteome yes. in your blood. So if you focus on understanding this pattern and you put the pattern back where it used to be, in a, in, it used to be you are preventing potentially a disease 20 years from now. So you cannot do that by focusing on individual variables. You have to look at pattern. Yep. No, I agree. And, and, you know, I try to cover this concept in my books and in my writings of this is the direction that things are going in. People are not always excited about it or a fan of it, but uh, it is happening and it is changing. Well, I want to, you know, thank you for helping everybody understand p-value. Um, I can't say that statistics was my favorite class, but I think it's critical to understand how some value that has been so critical to it is now in the process of change. And, um, you know, I look forward to talking to you next week on the, the webinar we're going to have on Friday uh, and, uh, and continuing the conversation beyond that. So uh, appreciate and uh, look forward to talking again. Thank you, Harry. It was a pleasure.